The bills in the Committee on Housing and Buildings are Intro 602, sponsored by Councilman Borelli, requiring that residential buildings constructed prior to 1968 be equipped with mechanisms enabling self-closing doors that prevent the spread of fire in corridors and stairways. Intro 604, sponsored by myself, requiring that where smoke detectors are installed near cooking devices in residential buildings, that they be equipped with a silence function on their photoelectric, or be photoelectric. Intro 606, sponsored by Council Member Richards, requiring the fire department to develop rules related to use of devices to assist in the emergency evacuation of individuals with limited mobility. The final bill in housing and buildings is Intro 610, sponsored by Council Member Torres, requiring landlords to provide tenants with stove knob covers. I'll hand it over to uh, my colleague, Council Member Borelli, for his opening remarks at this time. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Joe Borelli, Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. Uh, rather than repeat what uh, Council Member Cornegie said, I'll just mention some of the bills uh, in my committee. Intro 599, sponsored by Speaker Corey Johnson and myself, requiring the Fire Department to conduct targeted outreach to residential building owners and residents regarding the existing fire safety requirements and education. Introduction 603, sponsored by Council Member Constantides, requiring the Fire Department to, con to conduct fire hydrant inspections at least twice a year and report the on the findings of such inspections. And finally, Introduction 608 and 609, sponsored by Council Member Torres, which require that multiple family buildings place notice in such buildings advising the tenants of the importance of closing doors uh, and the Fire Department conduct tar targeted fire safety education for youth and parents. Just a quick comment on my bill, Intro 602. I, I want to share with you a very quick story. About three months ago, in November, got to get the date, November 16th, 2017, I posted a, a video of a fire that happened that day. And Ladder Company 148 pulled up to the scene of this fire that was on the corner of 9th Avenue and 50th Street in Brooklyn. And the chauffeur of Ladder 148 was a firefighter named McNeil. And this video is great. If you haven't seen it, it's a good video. So McNeil puts the aerial ladder on top of the roof. The members of the company go in. He sees a girl in the front bedroom window. And knowing where the fire was, he knew that no one in Ladder 148 was going to be going to that window in that room right away. So he looked for another company. None of the other companies had gotten there yet. Some minutes went by, seconds went by. He moved the, the aerial ladder to the girl's bedroom window. And now the video cuts in. And you see him ascending the, the stairs of the ladder. And he, 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 you lose him. There's so much smoke and flames that you can't even see him in the video. And then seconds later, you see him come down the ladder with this wonderful little you know, 10 or 11-year-old girl. And she's fine. And I posted the video, and uh, I guess on my social media, he reached out to me and said, you know, thanks for embarrassing me a little bit on the video. And I asked him, I said, there was so much smoke, and it seemed like so much time had passed. How, did, how was she fine? And he said, the first thing I told her was, can you close the door to the bedroom? And when she said yes, I yelled at her as commandingly as possible to go close the door to the window. And while he waited for other firefighters, while he had to move the ladder, while he had to put his bunker gear on, um, she was able to keep the smoke outside. So if a, a firefighter with 10 plus years experience, their first instinct was to tell this young girl to close the door, uh, I think it is something that we should uh, certainly be enacting, requiring that all multiple dwelling apartment buildings have built-in features that would accomplish this task. So uh, I am looking forward to passing this legislation. Uh, and I think I should also mention who's here. And today we're joined by Council Members Maisel, Redenchik, uh, Deutsch, Perkins, Chin, Jonai, and I saw Carlina Rivera, and Ms. Amprey Sampiel. Uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to um, allow for Council Member Deutsch uh, to speak on the three bills that he's co prime on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, today I speak in support of Intro 608, 609, and Intro 610. These three bills will take meaningful action to prevent future fire fatalities in New York City. In 2017, our city experienced a 52% increase in fire deaths, a stark contrast to 2016, during which we experienced the fewest fire deaths ever on record. In December alone, we lost 26 people in a, in a series of horrific fires in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. 
In the Bronx, 13 people lost their lives in a fire caused by a child playing with a stove, and the effects were intensified because a door was left open. Uh, intro 608 uh, seeks to educate people by requiring owners to, uh, of multiple dwellings units to post a notice in a public place, notifying residents of the importance of closing the door behind them when escaping a fire. Intro 609 takes the step one step further by requiring the Department of Education, the fire department, to develop and implement a comprehensive plan to educate children about common fire safety dangers. Intro 610 requires owners of multiple dwelling units to install stove uh, knob covers, a small device that costs just a few dollars, to prevent children from having the ability to play with a fire on a stovetop. All these three bills take proactive steps to prevent future tragedies. In addition to this, I want to thank 45 of my colleagues who signed into a letter urging the mayor and the speaker to renew funding for the Get Alarmed NYC initiative, which endeavors to purchase and install combination smoke CO alarms in every home in New York City. Finally, I want to commend Chair Borelli and uh, Chair Carnegie for their leadership as it relates to fire safety in the city, as well as Bronx Bar President Ruben Diaz Jr. and my colleague and co-sponsor, and actually um, sponsor of this bill, Councilmember Richie Torres, for his collab for their collaboration on these three bills. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, we're going to begin the uh, testimony portion of the hearing, um, and we'll just have uh, your testimony affirmed. Can you raise your right hand? Are you the only person testifying? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thanks. So uh, what we're going to do is um, just have whoever's testifying first just give your name rank. So uh, for those of us who don't know, um, and we can begin. Okay, uh, I'm uh, Chief of Operations John Sudnick from the FDNY. Okay, before I start, if I could just comment real quick on the, the story that uh, uh, Chairman Borelli uh, related, and I appreciate that story. Uh, when I hear, when I, in particular, when I hear things like that, I just think that uh, uh, it makes us so proud of, of all the people that work for the FDNY, and um, I think uh, that that goes to show how well-trained and well-equipped the FDNY is. So uh, we really appreciate you sharing that story with us. Okay, good morning, Chairman Borelli, Chairman Carnegie, and all of the council members present. My name is John Sudnick, and I am the Chief of Operations for the FDNY. I am joined this morning by Edward Ferrier, Deputy Assistant Chief from the Bureau of Fire Prevention, Julian Basil, Fire Code Counsel, and Fabrizio Caro, Director of Community Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about residential fires. Last year, the city experienced 73 fire deaths, 25 more than occurred in 2016, when there were 48 fire deaths, the fewest of any year in the last century. In the month of December alone, 26 people died in fires, the worst month for fire deaths in more than a quarter century. Part of the reason fire deaths increased dramatically last year was that three serious fires killed 22 people, including the multiple fire deaths that occurred in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. It is also important to put these numbers into context. Fire trends have been moving in the right direction. That is, they have been decreasing in general over the last decade. Even with the spate of tragic fires experienced at the end of last year, the city in 2017 experienced an 8% decline in serious fires from 2016 and a 15.5% decline from 2015. That's a difference of 400 fewer serious fires in two years. While we have worked hard in recent years to educate millions of New Yorkers about fire safety, recent tragedies demonstrate that our work is far from over and that we must continue to provide continue providing life-saving knowledge about how to prevent fires 
and what to do if you're in a fire situation. In response to the Bronx fire that killed 13 people, the department undertook a variety of actions. In the days following the fire, the FDNY Fire Safety Education Unit coordinated public education and information sharing in areas throughout the immediate neighborhood. The unit also collaborated with NYPD Community Affairs to provide resources at a community event benefiting fire victims that was organized by a neighborhood church. We met with the local community board to coordinate neighborhood and school-based presentations throughout the district in January. We also attended the Bronx Borough President's Borough Servant's Cabinet meeting, sharing general fire safety education information to all community board district managers and committed to and encouraged an ongoing collaboration to conduct fire safety outreach throughout the borough. That meeting led to many presentations and scheduled events being coordinated with tenant associations, school groups, and parent associations. We also worked with the American Red Cross in sponsoring a smoke alarm giveaway event where we distributed 400 fire alarms free to local residents and we assisted the Department of Housing Preservation and Development by providing fire safety materials for them to dis distribute in their own outreach to residential buildings. The department also conducted a great deal of community outreach and education following a December fire in Sheepshead Bay that claimed the lives of four family members who died when an unattended menorah started a fire in their home. Immediately afterwards, our fire safety education unit responded to the neighborhood and worked with community leaders to disseminate, disseminate fire safety publications addressing smoke alarm awareness and general fire safety practices for religious observances. Our community affairs unit followed up and coordinated several fire safety presentations throughout the district in January and February. Events were held with community-based organizations, schools, and tenant groups. Fire safety education attended and spoke at the local community board's monthly meeting and worked with the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs to convene meetings with faith leaders in Sheepshead Bay, Midwood, and Flatbush. These were two of the higher profile incidents last year, but our fire safety education unit responds to all fatal fires and major incidents. In the wake of such events, the team conducts public educational initiatives within 24 to 48 hours in the immediate surrounding area and community engagement staff canvasses neighborhoods the week after major incidents to schedule follow-up fire safety presentations at schools, faith-based and civic organizations, and businesses. These events are coordinated with community boards, elected officials, and other community stakeholders in order to maximize exposure and participation. Engaging with the community to provide fire and life safety education is a, a critical component of our mission as a department. In 2017, we held more than 8,000 fire safety events and educated 700,000 New Yorkers about the life-saving strategies that focus on fire prevention. Large majority of our fire prevention outreach is proactive and we place a targeted focus on the city's most vulnerable populations and at-risk communities. Through strategic outreach and in response to requests, the Fire Safety Education Unit conducts education and information sharing classroom and group uh, presentations, public and community events, planned visits to firehouses, hands-on practice in mobile fire safety, exp safety experience trailers, and distribution of educational messaging via FDNY social media and publications that are available in a large variety of languages. We partner with community groups, schools, senior centers, city agencies, faith leaders, and elected officials. During the last year, we increased the size of our community affairs unit and the staff works closely with our fire safety education unit in creating partnerships and enhancing interaction and cooperation with community groups. We will continue making improvements so that our community engagement is as, as, as effective as possible. Since December, fire and life safety messaging on FDNY social media has reached 5.2 million views. This includes content that reminds New Yorkers to close the door when escaping a fire and teaches them the importance of having 
the working smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, of creating and practicing an escape plan, of careless smoking prevention, and other winter and seasonal safety information. We are also planning to enhance our cooperation with New York City Emergency Management to create additional opportunities to provide education on fire and emergency preparedness in targeted neighborhoods. This effort will include participation of the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, the NYPD, the Bronx Borough President's Office, and the American Red, Red Cross, and we will continue reaching out to additional elected officials as the effort progresses. We are also working to strengthen our collaboration with the City's Department of Education to increase the number of classroom and parent association presentations and work with DOE social media platforms to promote fire safety. And we're partnering with the Department of Youth and Community Development to organize student visits to firehouses and EMS stations. These visits will incorporate information on fire and life safety resources. In a digital world, we know that the effective use of web resources and social media is critical to reaching our intended audience. In 2017, we received over 18.6 million views of FDNY smart content, which consists of fire and life safety educational materials, including tips, videos, PSAs, graphics, and firsthand accounts from our members and from individuals who were rescued. FDNY smart material is translatable into 100 languages, and visits were up nearly 40 percent from 2016. We are excited about all these efforts, but of course, we are always looking for ways to improve our outreach. I'll briefly address the legislation that is being considered during today's hearing. Intro 602, which requires self-closing doors in multiple dwellings, we support this bill. Intro 610, which requires landlord, landlords to provide stovetop childproof knob covers. We support the intent of this bill, and we are happy to work with the Council and our fellow agencies regarding the specifics of compliance and enforcement in the final version of the bill. Intro 604, which regulates placement of alarms near cooking appliances. It is our understanding that the Department of Buildings is currently undergoing the process of revising the building code. We defer to the Department of Buildings code revision on this topic. Intro 608, which requires landlords to place notices in conspicuous locations directing residents to close the door when escaping a fire. We support this bill. There is already a requirement for residential buildings to place a notice on the inside of apartment doors with this and other fire safety information. Spreading this message via conspicuously placed signs elsewhere would be useful. Intro 606, which requires buildings to be equipped with a device to assist evacuation of individuals with limited mobility. We oppose this bill. The fire department will not rely on equipment and we do not tr that we do not train on and maintain for our own use. In addition to a number of practical concerns, the presence of, a, of stair descent devices presents operational concerns during an emergency, as they could inhibit the egress of residents leaving a b the building and first responders entering it. Intro 603, which would require that the department conduct and report fire hydrant inspections at specific time frames. We oppose this bill. Fire department regulations already require inspections of hydrants on a more frequent and more sophisticated basis than described in the council bill. Intro 609, which requires the department to develop and implement a plan to provide education to children and parents about fire safety. We would like additional information on what is intended by this bill. The fire department already has a full-fledged program of outreach to students and young residents and in 2017, we conducted more than 1,000 education events in schools pre-K through eighth grade. We are always looking to expand our outreach, and we would be happy to discuss partnering with the council or individual council members about conducting events in specific locations or enhancing the department's ability to hold more events. In June 599, which would require the department to make a good faith effort to conduct direct outreach to owners and occupants of multiple dwellings. We support the concept of this bill, and we would like to know more about the level of direct outreach that is contemplated. 
We currently require that building owners distribute a fire safety guide to tenants and ensure that a fire safety notice is affixed on the inside of the apartment door in multiple dwellings. We are in the process of replacing the fire safety guide with a more comprehensive emergency preparedness guide, <coughs> excuse me, guide which owners will be required to distribute. We are open-minded about distributing other materials to owners and occupants. We look forward to learning more about this bill and we would be happy to discuss partnering with the council or individual council members about conducting events in specific locations or enhancing the department's ability to hold more events. Once again, I'd like to thank the committees for holding this hearing today on this important topic. The fire department has worked hard to achieve success in our mission of protecting the lives and property of New Yorkers and the millions of people who visit our city every year. But we know that there is always more work to be done and we look forward to working with the council towards greater success in areas of fire safety and fire prevention. We'd be happy to take your questions at this time. I just want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Councilmember Espinal who's joined us. Um, and I just want to say that I would be remiss if I didn't, before we continue the hearing, thank you for your service. Um, as somebody who is acutely aware that while so much of the city is running away from these type of emergencies, you guys are required to go in and save lives. So I just want you to know that uh, from a, from a um, committee chairman standpoint, we really appreciate the work that the FDNY does in protecting the safety of individuals in this city. Um, and I'm going to defer my questions to begin with uh, to some of my colleagues who unfortunately uh, can't stay in the entirety of the hearing. I'm going to begin with uh, Council Member Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. And uh, once again, I just want to thank the fire department, the men and women of the fire department for, for the great uh, work that they do and they put their lives in line each and every day. And I just want to mention that it's also important that after a fire is, you know, people tend to go and um, when there's a fire at, at a building or, or, or a house that they watch the fire and then the fire gets put out and then people just walk away. But we always need to remember that, you know, before you walk away, it's always good to question were there any firefighters injured and to go out of our way to pay a visit and to make sure that, that those firefighters are okay. Um, so that's important to mention. Um, so I had uh, two fires in my district uh, with the first one was uh, back in 2015 where um, seven young brothers and sisters uh, died in, on the Bedford Avenue fire that's just down the block for where I reside. And, Every day I pass a number of times and I see that boarded up house. And, um, and then just a few months ago, the East 14th Street in Sheepshead Bay, where a mother and three young children um, perished in that fire, which also left a father and uh, three young children in the ho hospitalized, which thank God they're doing okay. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're out of the hospital. Um, so I just want to mention that uh, two of the three bills um, that um, uh, I co-sponsored today with my colleague, uh, Councilmember Richie Torres and uh, Bronx Borough President um, Ruben Diaz. I see on one of the bills, uh, intro 609, uh, you mentioned here we would like additional information of, on what is attended by this bill. So um, over the last uh, three years, I had most probably like four dozen fire safety uh, events in my district, around my district. Just last month I held four, and this month I so far had three in my district. Um, as well as a meeting with educators, we had about 40 educators in a room uh, with the chief of department and the fire commissioner where they uh, collaborated of coming up with some type of comprehensive education outreach to bring to students of schools. So we're talking about uh, public schools, private schools, um, which is important to educate our young adults uh, of, on fire safety. And it's, it's pretty simple, so I just don't understand um, what you testified here by mentioning that we would like additional information. Uh, you are the fire experts, um, and I think that this is a, a common sense bill to put together a comprehensive plan education uh, with 
collaboration with DOE and to bring this education throughout uh, our schools. Now in, 2000, in 2017, uh, 2016, I think we had the highest reduction in fire deaths um, in the 150 years that uh, the fire department um, is in existence. And in 2017, fires did go down 8%, um, but tragedies went up 54%. So we know we, we can bring fires down, and now all we need to do is to bring those tragedies down. And by going out and educating our young adults with a comprehensive um, education plan, we could bring those numbers down and bring those numbers to record lows. So if you could just explain to me um, on you know, what additional information you would need in order to support this vote, fully support intro 609. Well, I, I, we, do, uh, we do support um, the intent of the bill. Uh, there's nothing more important in these uh, than fire safety education, especially when it, it comes to children. I suppose what we're looking for uh, are more details and more particulars on how we could reach more, more children. We already um, have a fire safety education campaign um, that we've reached uh, over a thousand schools. Um, we'd like to continue that. I guess what we're looking for is some information and maybe we could work with DOE on how to get that, uh, get more information out there. Well, one thing to note though, we are in conversation right now with the Department of Education in terms of analyzing what schools we've targeted and worked with throughout the year and seeing in which way we can work with administrators in terms of getting into those schools that we haven't done thus far. In addition, we are working with the Department of Youth and Community Development that works alongside with DOE on many programmings and to highlight one partnership, we're looking to amplify our annual open houses, primarily working with the Department of Youth and Community Development to target all their, um, their programs that target uh, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade and opening our firehouse doors and EMS stations across the board, uh, basically to implement and enhance fire and life safety messaging. So- Wait, I'm sorry, can you just give your name and title for the record? Oh, Fabricio Carr, Director of Community Affairs for FDNY. Thank you. So we are doing extensive outreach, but as, as the chief did say, we'd be more interested in terms of how to implement whatever plan that the council has um, and seeing which way we can work collaboratively. So. Uh, thank you. So I, I'd just um, like for you to continue to work with uh, the committee chairman to get whatever it is that you need so that we can move forward expeditiously, obviously. Okay. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence, the presence of uh, Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Richie Torres. Uh, and I'll defer now to my to the uh, to chair uh, Borelli. Thank you very much. Um, ju just with uh, f intro 599, um, you mentioned in your testimony, Chief Sudnick. Again, thank you for coming, and th thanks for the kind words earlier. Um, that there was a 40 percent uptick in in visits. Is that to the department's information? FDNY smart material, excuse me. Could you repeat that? In the testimony, it mentioned that there's a 40% uptick in visits to the smart FDNY smart material. Is, I guess my question is what drove that 40% uptick from 2016 to 2017? Well, a couple of things in terms of not only proactive outreach in terms of the website and, and the tool, but in addition, just unfortunately with the tragedies that have occurred, the need for more fire safety awareness and people actually going then to the website to utilize it. Um, can you go through just the materials that are, are distributed to the public? Uh, do you provide the landlords with specific pamphlets, um, you know, sort of like a lead, paint, a lead paint disclosure, or is it up to the landlord, or who actually crafts the materials? Julian Basil, Fire Code Counsel for the Fire Department. Um, the New York City Fire Code has for some time required um, that building owners distribute to all uh, residents of multiple dwellings and building staff um, fire safety guide and notices that are designed to make them aware of the design of their building, the fire protection systems, and various fire prevention measures, as well as emergency procedures. 
Um, this is something that's spelled out uh, in the fire code and elaborated upon in a fire department rule. Um, and the, it, the, the code and the rules require that building owners um, uh, publish the, 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 the material that's set out in the code and the rules and distribute them annually to building residents. Um, this is, uh, in addition, the emergency procedures in the event of a fire uh, is a, a notice that's required to be posted on the back of the dwelling unit door, uh, and um, that is also uh, an obligation of the owner. So the onus is on the owner to comply with these rules and regulations. Do, do we know if this is happening? Do I mean, since we don't regularly inspect uh, residential buildings, w right. what's the follow-up? How do we know this current? Right. Well, I, I think uh, at the time that this was promulgated, this was promulgated in response to fatal fires. I think there was a lot of public awareness of it. Um, there may be some anecdotal evidence now that people are not focusing as much on it. I do think, uh, as was indicated in the testimony, we're in the process of uh, finalizing a rule that, uh, pursuant to the 2014 fire code, that will expand the fire safety guide into uh, a, a broader, more comprehensive emergency preparedness, um, and we will update the notice as well. And I think at the time, that we promulgate that rule will first it'll be published for public comment but when finalized i think we are going to look at uh, our enforcement methods uh, as you're correct that the the fire department doesn't have a inspection program for uh, inside of dwelling units we do typically require that the uh, what's called the building information sheet be posted in the lobby so that is one way that we can uh, inspect it uh, and but we we definitely open to other ways of uh, ensuring that there's compliance with this important requirement. Um, turning to intro 603 uh, on the fire hydrant inspections, um, you said that our bill would actually, your policy rather is to go beyond the, the two annual inspections. W what is the FDNY policy and, and what are the regulations that you require? Okay, we. The fire department has, in our regulations, we, we do have a, a provision uh, that requires inspections semi-annually uh, in the spring and in the fall. Uh, so so we already, we're already doing that. But at each and every response to a structural fire that our companies respond to, they would test the fire hydrant that uh, the engine companies uh, uh, put their apparatus in front of. They'll test those hydrants for functionality. So that's an additional check. Uh, during cold weather, we have a requirement uh, for in freezing weather that we um, inspect hydrants that are, have known from past experience to be in danger of freezing, and we'll go out and inspect those, and uh, if they were found frozen, we'll send uh, a thawing apparatus to go and thaw those, those hydrants out. So um, in addition to the semi-annual inspections, we do get out there and during our regular course of business. And, and perform additional inspections. D does a fire hydrant that's non, not malfunctioning, does it freeze? It depends. Uh, there could be, it could be uh, in varying degrees of, of uh, serviceability. Uh, it could have uh, some minor defects. It could be missing some caps that it will function properly. Um, I, I guess a better question, it, 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 despite the temperature, say it's you know, 15 degrees out, there's no reason to assume that an operable fire hydrant would not just freeze on its own without having some underlying problem. Correct. Uh, fire hydrants have drains. Um, if the drain is working properly, uh, there's, there's no reason to believe that fire hydrant would not operate properly in freezing weather. Who is doing the inspections now? Uh, On-duty firefighters do, do our hydrant inspections. And, uh, how many, you know, r roughly how, how often, how many hydrants does it average that a company would inspect? Uh, that depends also. Um, I don't have a number on the average, but uh, depending on the size of a district, it could be anywhere from a few hundred to a 300 to, um, you know, over a thousand. And I, mean, I guess just what's sort of the concern, though, if, if we're the council and we're just mandating a lower standard than that which you already meet by your own regulations? I mean, is there a concern that we're just putting in code what is policy? Uh, we just 
you know, we, we've been using, we've been following this regulation for decades. Uh, <coughs> when the fire department, you know, we don't believe that putting it to code would would create an additional safety factor for, for us, um, for the residents of the city, uh, for something that we're already doing. Um, and then just finally, before I turn it over, um, intro 606, uh, the emergency evacuation assistance. Um, what, what, what is the department procedure for evacuating someone just overall with, with limited mobility issues? Is there a specific thing? Uh, we, we don't have a, a specific policy, policy for people with limited mobility. Um, you know, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very difficult uh, to define what limited mobility is. Uh, we treat all our, uh, our, our, our victims, our potential victims, uh, the same. We, we conduct um, searches and we, we uh, will remove people when they need to be removed, regardless of whether if they have a, d a disability or not. If, if we have, a, um, for one reason or another, if it's a, a particularly difficult removal or rescue, we'll call for additional resources and we'll put additional personnel on, on that particular uh, a removal or rescue. Um, do any buildings now in New York City require uh, mobility assistant devices like chairs or uh, the, the boards with the handles or anything like that? I don't believe so. I, I to yeah, I'm, I'm uh, not aware of a specific requirement. I do think that some building owners have uh, elected to provide some of these devices, but um, I don't know, I couldn't say that they're widespread. And I mean, it, it, have there ever been an incident where one of these devices caused a, a problem? I, I understand your rationale where you wouldn't expect people to, to use a device that they're not trained to use, um, but has there been an incident where <coughs> these, these uh, devices have caused a problem? Yeah, I, I don't know of a specific in, uh, incident where it's caused a problem. It's just um, from my experience, any time that you put a device in a stairway uh, that will limit egress from that building for occupants and uh, ingress for fire department members to operate in that building. So uh, we, we generally like to have our stairwells uh, wider mm -hmm. uh, for operational uh, reasons. Okay. Thank you. So part of the impetus for this hearing was to, to uh, delve deep into this anecdotal idea that there's a correlation between uh, heating outages and uh, an increase in uh, fire and death. For example, when there's no heat, there's um, alternative methods for heating apartments that people are using. I'm curious as to whether or not <clears throat> the city has done a study and what the result, if so, what the results of that study, if there's a correlation between heating outages and alternative heating methodologies and fires, statistically, is there any, um, is there any uh, support to that idea? Okay, uh, and with a preliminary look at the data, um, we haven't found anything, um, but I believe the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, MOTA, is taking a look at it. So um, we, we haven't seen at this point a, a direct correlation between the two. Um, so, um, but you are correct. I believe if the heat is out in a building and people are using their stove to to heat their unit or heat their apartment, there is certainly um, a safety concern as, as far as uh, the potential for creating fire. Uh, also, the use of um, uh, portable heating devices, whether they're approved or unapproved, is certainly a concern as well. So um, the short of it is, um, I believe the, the Mayor's Office of Data and Analytics is taking a look at that to see if there's any correlation. Well, today, do we know whether or not any of the fires that were mentioned by my colleagues today are attributed to alternative heating devices? And if so, how many? Uh, we've had, it seems to me, an inordinate amount of fatalities associated to fire uh, than any other time that I can remember. Um, 
and I'm just wondering if we know how many of those are attributed to alternative heating devices, because uh, that would help me in formulating an idea on whether or not there's a correlation prior to getting the mayor's data back. Okay. Um, the primary cause of our fires are, 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 are fatal fires, um, are uh, open flame, um, electrical, and careless smoking. That's the data that we collected. Um, more specifically, um, I have the causes of fires from December of last year through the end of January this year, and I could read them off for you if you like. Uh, of the okay, of the fatal fires with with from Jan from December through January, uh, incense on December third was the cause of that. Uh, December 3rd, smoking. December 18th, candle menorah. December 20th, smoking. December 25th, smoking. December 25th, candle. December 28th, juvenile fire play. December, December 29th was a space heater. December 31st was smoking. January 7th was electrical wiring. January 12th was a halogen lamp. January 14th, hot plate. January 28th, incense. So um, I definitely want to follow whatever trends, and, would, and, and I'm going to follow up with the mayor's office to see what that data suggests. Uh, but I'm also curious as to whether or not, like, do we know the difference between how many of the fatalities were caused by actual flames and how many were caused by smoke inhalation? Do you have that broken down? Or do you generally break that down? And, and for the fire where there were 13 fatalities, I'm just curious as to how many were accounted, how many do we account to actual the, the, flames? The cause of death? Yes. Uh, I, we don't have that broken down. Um, I believe you could probably get that from the ME's office. Um, how many people died in the fire apartment? Or that were residents of the fire apartment? Uh, which fire we are? In the, the Bronx fire, the 13 deaths? Oh, uh, see, oh yeah, that's zero. zero. It was the, the fire extended from the fire apartment yeah, through the rest of the building. And I mean, just, just from media reports, how many people died in uh, apartments that were above it or on the same floor? I, th I believe that all the, all the victims were either above or in adjoining apartments. Okay. Would, uh, I mean, just again from media, media reports that the door didn't close, um, in your estimation, if, if the door to that apartment had been closed, how much longer would have it prevented smoke from entering the adjacent units? Well, that, that's, uh, that's difficult to uh, determine. Uh, first, I, I have to, uh, I'm going to refrain from giving too many particulars on that particular fire due to pending litigation, but I could speak in general about the importance of, of closing a door. Um, you, you referred to it a, uh, anecdotally, uh, by the way, in your opening comment about the firefighter giving direction f to an occupant at a window to close the door, and that's absolutely the right thing. Who's to sitting do. in a, a classroom in Brooklyn probably today. Right. Yeah, perfectly and, fine. Right. And, um, and, and that's actually what we do. When, when we operate, our first thing that uh, we, we train our members to do is to close a door to confine a fire. Uh, before we um, before we start our attack on the fire with our hose lines, um, just simply closing a door will uh, will confine the fire enough where we, we could buy ourselves more time, buy the occupants more time. So, um, without specifically talking about any particular fire, um, I could tell you um, that a, a, an operable door or, or closing a door uh, will certainly prevent a fire from extending. Uh, that said, uh, fires extend in other ways as sure. well. That's why it's difficult to, 
to answer your question because fire can extend up other, depending on the type of bu building you're talking about, you could have interior voids of a building where fire could, could spread and could extend uh, depending on the, the type of building. That and and for about. smoke, w would a door also have a, a, a measurable impact on the prevention of smoke spreading? Again, to a certain extent, it will prevent the, all, all the byproducts of combustion f that occur during a fire. A, a closed door would, uh, would um, s slow down the spread of that. Uh, would, it wouldn't totally eliminate the, the spread of smoke throughout a building. Depending, again, on the type of building that we're talking about, it's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to answer that question, um, you know, uh, in, in all cases. But, but certainly, closing a door will, uh, will, will slow the spread of the byproducts of combustion. Sure. Thank you. Uh, on the idea of investigation, I'm curious as to how, what's the usually, generally, the length of time between investigating the origins uh, of a fire and closing out that case, is there an average time that, so you, you send, there's a, there's a fire occurrence, you send an investigator in. Yeah. Uh, is there an average time generally that a case is closed out? There, there's not an average time. Every, every case is different. Um, obviously, some are more complex than others, so uh, it, it'll take a, a greater period of time to uh, do our due diligence to examine the cause the origin before that case is closed out. What's the average response time to a residential fire? I believe I have that information for the, um, in fiscal year 2017, our, our average response time for uh, structural fires uh, is four minutes and 13 seconds. Um, I'm going to my colleague, Mark Jonah, has questions. Good morning. Let me just begin by thanking you for the job that you do day in and day out and for keeping New Yorkers safe. My first comment are to the chairs, Carnegie and uh, Borelli. I hope that um, when these pieces of legislation do get passed, in whatever final form they are, that there will be no carve-outs for NYCHA or SROs or hotels or hospitals or school dorms. Um, I think we all New Yorkers should be safe in their homes. So um, my question to you on intro 604. What is the current code for smoke alarms when it comes to locations within a cooking appliance? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sir? Intro 604, right. what is the current code of smoke alarms locations to a cooking appliance? Right. Um, the, this is uh, addressed in the uh, building code in the New York City Department of Buildings rules. Typically, um, depending on when the building was constructed, or constructed and, and or altered, um, there's a requirement for a smoke alarm within 15 feet of the sleeping room. Um, in newer buildings, there would be a smoke detector inside the sleeping room, um, and uh, there may also be requirements for smoke detectors in, um, in, uh, in the basement and furnaces and that area. So would this further complicate the current requirements within 10 feet so at that point you can have back-to-back -back smoke alarms? Well, I, I think... First of all, this is really, we would defer to the Department of Buildings on to talk about smoke detector and smoke detector requirements because it is their code and their rules. I would say generally that the fire department obviously strongly supports uh, smoke detectors um, and carbon monoxide detectors. They're life-saving measures. They um, alert, you know, the public to the need, uh, to the existence of fire and the need to evacuate. Having said that, um, it actually is fairly complicated in trying to decide where to put them and what's the best uh, location and the best technologies uh, because there are so many different types of occupancies. Um, as the Fire Code Council, we, in our own fire code development, we, we have a process where we bring in uh, stakeholders, including building owners, to talk about these kinds of issues. This, this would be something that would be addressed through the building code revision process, and I, I think um, uh, I would, you know, we, we follow national standards and national standards continuously evolve. 
the, the, I, I think the bill re re reflects some of the uh, national standards that have been put out by the National Fire Protection Association, and it may well be that the city will adopt what is being addressed in the, uh, in the bill, but I think it's very important that this go through a code process where all the stakeholders have an opportunity to comment and people most familiar with the best way to install carbon monoxide detectors and, uh, and smoke detectors in residential premises. It's, it, you know, there are all kinds of different arrangements and when you start talking about distance requirements, uh, you know, and, and that may work fine in some apartments, in other apartments it just doesn't make any sense. So I, I, I guess a, that's generally how I would respond, although on the specific details I really would have to defer to the Department of Buildings. So I guess your response is it's well intended but leave it to the experts? <laughs> Something like that. Got it. <laughs> and just to follow up on that question, it requires a silence function or the use of photoelectric detection. To the best of your knowledge, do such mechanisms currently exist? Yeah, I, I think um, smoke detectors have silence functions. Um, the difficulty sometimes is they're difficult to reach depending where they're placed. So, you know, people get frustrated and take out the batteries, which is the fire department's real enforcement, uh, you know, uh, a policy is to make sure that they're working, they have batteries in them. That's the most important thing. Um, but yes, they do have silence uh, technology as to all of these technologies are moving pretty quickly and I think the prob the reason why they talk about these different types of technologies is some are better, work better to rule out the, the toast, the burnt toast from a real fire or the shower steam from, uh, from a fire. So they are, the technologies are moving in ways that I think eventually in the not too distant future will take into consideration the most common false alarms. But uh, yes, I, I, I think that uh, the technologies are there, um, and I think that uh, through the code revision, the n new buildings that are coming in will start to reflect these new technologies. The new technology you're referring to is not the one that's referred to in this bill. A silence function, isn't that defeating the purpose that you would want it audible so everyone could hear it? If not, if you're asleep, wouldn't you want the audio? No, I think that, as I understand the silence function, I think it's, it's when it goes off unnecessarily, when, the, when you're burning some toast or there's some uh, minor food uh, that sets off the detector, the, the, the homeowner or the uh, resident can just push this button and temporarily silence it. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long that silence function works, but then the, then the, the, uh, the, the uh, detector resumes operation. I believe that's the, what they're referring to. Thank you. Yeah. On intro 606, uh, it's interesting that you brought up these mechanisms that could be used for evacuation of individuals with limited mobility. Uh, and I clearly understand the concerns about obstruction of common areas and whether it be egress or uh, for the fire department uh, to gain access. Most of these devices, do they operate on electric, I would imagine? I'm not certain, but I would think they would. Uh, in a typical fire, uh, electric service is interrupted? Not necessarily. No? So could it further? And especially in, during the incipient stages of a fire, I, you know, there's a good chance that the electric uh, is still operating. Most buildings have uh, platforms in between. How would such a mechanism even be practical when there's platforms and breaks in staircases where there isn't a continuous seven-story decline. That's a good point. Yeah. Leave it to the experts. <laughs> On intro 608, you refer to signage laws that currently exist when the back of apartment doors, there is currently signs that indicate what you should or should not do in case of a fire? That's correct. How would this further um, make tenants aware if there's one on every door legally there should be on the, on the entrance doors to each apartment. Where else would you see what, a notice? Will this bill? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, the information that's on the back of the door is a, a series of instructions. It's, I guess, a, you're typically about a five by eight 
uh, form. Um, and one of those instructions right now is close, uh, you know, if you're in the fire department, close the door as you leave. Um, certainly, uh, when we redo this, we, there's no reason why we couldn't enhance that and make that even more uh, important, highlighted. Um, I, 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 I think, uh, so there is something already in place. I mean, if the council feels that something more needs to be done and really make this um, sort of front and center, you know, I mean, there are signs in the hallway in case of fire, you use the, <clears throat> use the stairs, not the elevator. I mean, it could be that kind of sign. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's a judgment call as to uh, whether we should have a very specific sign uh, that, that says this or whether this could be part of uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, notice or combined with other signage. There's quite a bit of signage in apartment buildings these days. Yes, there is. <laughs> and my last question on intro 609, how would we even re how would we enforce these stove knobs, which I would imagine have to be removed to have operational use of the stoves? Is there another mechanism that you're aware, or is it a permanent? Yeah, from from the fire department's perspective, uh, in, enforcement for us would be very difficult. I'd have to refer to HPD to see if they have a uh, different opinion on the enforcement of the use of these um, these protective knobs. Currently, I believe you give away these protective knobs to participating families that. Is it part of the program of the giveaways uh, that the fire department does? Currently, no. I mean, in terms of the material that we distribute, knobs isn't one of the giveaways that we provide. However, though, in terms of educational material when it comes to cooking safety, we do distribute uh, pamphlets, and we do emphasize cooking safety across the board on every presentation uh, in terms of enforcing a kid-free zone around the stove and also the importance of not leaving cooking unattended. On our current stove apparatuses, aren't there certain stoves that require a clicking of a sweat before igniting? Wouldn't that be more practical than these removable child-proof safety knobs that would have to be removed to have operational use of the stove and would have to be replaced at any moment? I, I think what you're referring to, a, a pilot light lit stoves versus uh, electrical uh, lighting stove. Um, I'm not sure which, uh, you know, I guess that depends. Um, you know, certainly the uh, uh, common sense would say uh, just like a child-proof uh, cap on a, um, on a medication, anything that would uh, make it more difficult for a child to operate that would certainly be more better would be beneficial so something more practical that couldn't be removed temporarily for use to be replaced uh, something more permanent <clears throat> on the stove would be more common sense it wouldn't be it would make more sense than something that would be removed and potentially not put back on i, I would uh, i would agree with your assessment on that thank you Uh, Councilmember Gradenchik. I get to get longer arms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of questions about um, Intro uh, 606. I know you're not fond of it. Um, do you know of any buildings in the City of New York that are equipped right now with devices like the Intro calls for? Is there? I've never seen it myself, but I haven't visited every building. Uh, I, I don't know of any that, that have that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if nursing homes have that required. I have to refer to DOB. I've never I seen DOB it in a nursing here, home either. I mean, I've, yeah. I've never seen it there either. They Obviously, I would believe, I, I know that nursing homes, um, the, the men and women of the FDNY uh, obviously have the plans. They have, uh, they meet with, I assume they meet with the the uh, operators of nursing homes on a regular basis to go over evacuation plans and all that. Yeah, we haven't seen we haven't seen that. Um, again, you know, depending on the type of occupancy we're talking about, um, you know, it, it may not even be beneficial to uh, remove certain um, 
certain uh, occupants, uh, depending on the location and extent of the fire. Uh, the, the devices that, I, that come to my mind when we're talking about these are ones that you may see in private houses where you're looking to go from the second floor to the first floor, and that's more of a, uh, you know, used for um, convenience and safety, just generally going, you know, in the, in the general course of living. Uh, I, I don't, I never heard of them being recommended for use in case of the, an emergency, but. Well, what's your, as a chief of the New York City Fire Department, one of the chiefs, what's your best advice for people with limited mobility? They stay where they are and call 911 and wait for the fire department to come and get them? Certainly we, uh, you, you'd want them to call 911 immediately upon, uh, you know, to report that fire. The faster we can get there, the faster we could help them. Again, I, you know, without getting in too much uh, into specifics, depending on the type of building they're in, um, if you're in a fireproof building, for example, and the fire is not in your apartment, you're generally, generally speaking, safer in, in to stay in your apartment um, and keeping the door closed. Um, if you're in a non-fireproof uh, building, you know, it's, uh, you know, you'd may want to, if depending on, again, uh, the seriousness of the fire, you'd want to evacuate that building and get, and get out of that building. So, um, but the faster you could report it, the better it is uh, for us. The faster we can get there, the faster we could help you. Last, last question. For people with limited mobility, I know, and I've, I've been in fire trucks, uh, I've got, I think, three houses in my district. Um, you have the plans of the building when you're going to a fire, to fight a fire. Is there anything in that computer that tells you that there are people with limited mobility, somebody might be in a wheelchair or anything like that? Uh, nothing that we could rely on with 100% uh, certainty. I mean, we do have some uh, information that we, we put in ourselves at times where if we had a, um, uh, a handicapped person, uh, you know, we could uh, potentially put that into our critical information dispatch, but, uh, you know, we can't rely on that 100% because no, uh, people, you know, people generally are transient, so if it's uh, a, a person uh, may, may be there living in that apartment, uh, if it's, you know, one year and may not be there the next. Is there a mechanism for somebody to report to the fire department that, you know, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair and I, you know, would like you to the know The best that. way to do it would be um, on 911 when you make the phone call and give that information to our, our dispatchers and let them know that you're handicapped and tell us what floor you're on, what apartment you're in, and we can get there and, and help you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I do want to revisit the, um, the mobility because during Sandy, one of the concerns was that there was difficulty moving folks, especially seniors. Uh, and the potential for uh, fatalities was very high, you know, so it was averted to some degree, but I know that the city uh, had said that they were going to develop some type of a database that would allow during crisis situations to be able to identify uh, pre, you know, prior to the crisis. Um, obviously that hasn't happened. Uh, certainly I'm going to talk to my colleagues uh, about what we can do. Uh, before there's another large scale crisis like we saw in Sandy. After that, it revealed the necessity for this database, um, and I'm a little disappointed that we haven't created it to date. This is not an indictment of the FDNY. I just think that there's a larger idea that if we were to get into a crisis situation similar to that, or any clo anywhere close to any scale disaster that we've seen in the city, which I won't mention, um, not being able to identify prior to the crisis, individuals who may need special assistance in moving could result in a higher degree of fatality. So we should definitely uh, have a database available and ready to assist the FDNY and other first responders in the instance that this takes place. Yeah, I, I can't comment specifically about that because I, I believe that is also a pending, there's pending litigation on, on that. Um, but again, maintaining a, da a database uh, to, with uh, uh, a certain degree of accuracy is, is very challenging uh, when it comes to uh, instances like this. Um, I, I think prior to um, a, a storm, there is advanced warning, advanced notice, and I think that would be a good time uh, for the public to, uh, to for, for the city to reach out to the public and, and look for assistance. And we've done that in the past where before a storm, 
uh, has occurred, we've actually helped uh, evacuate uh, handicapped um, and people with limited mobility uh, from their occupancies and, and move them to shelters. And I think that's a good way to go, a good plan. Uh, and the same thing in the follow-up after the storm as well, um, utilize um, the, same, the same type of uh, method to uh, report uh, if you needed, if you had lost power to your, to your, if your area lost power, your building lost power and you need assistance uh, to come up with a, um, you know, a plan to, to help those people as well. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Williams and Council Member Brennan. Uh, there's questions from Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I wanted to also thank the fire department uh, for your service. And in my district, I have my share of uh, fires and tragedies. But it's gotten better because there has been a lot more education and outreach um, events and activity materials that's translated. So I think on the legislation about posting notice about the importance of closing doors, um, I think one of that is I want to make sure that there are requirement for translation, that for landlords to sort of know their residents. I mean, if they have a residents that don't speak English, they have to make sure that the material is translated in different languages. I know that, as you said, you know, uh, building code mandate, there is, um, you have to post something in the back of the door. I get that in my building every year, and I put it right in the, in the back of the door, so every morning when I leave, I s get reminded but not everybody do that, and not everybody get that notice. So in your testimony earlier in answering question, you said that you do inspect buildings, but you only see uh, if they have signs posted in, in the lobby area. Because one of the things is like, how do we enforce to make sure that people are doing that? So minimally, if we require a building owner to post that notice, uh, maybe by the mailbox, some place where residents will be able to see it every day, um, and the city can and the fire department can check on that. Uh, yes, uh, the rule does require that it be posted <clears throat> in the uh, in the lobby. Um, as I said before, the fire department doesn't really have an inspection program inside apartment uh, dwellings, so um, we uh, it, you know enforcing this is sometimes a complicated issue. As I think with our new rule, we're going to revisit uh, the best way to enforce it to, uh, and, and, and do a lot of outreach and make sure the building owner is aware of this obligation and the need to, to comply. Uh, and we're open to other suggestions as to uh, effective ways to, uh, to get enforcement. Definitely. I mean, I think that's minimally requiring them to post it in a place where every resident will be able to see. And I think the translation, you know, in the different languages um, is also important to make sure that everyone understand um, fire safety. And my next question is regarding parents and students, uh, the comprehensive plans that we're asking about in one of the legislation, is that I know the fire department, you go out there and you do the school, but it should be in the curriculum that every child should learn about fire safety. It doesn't make sense that for you to just go out there. It should be part of the curriculum so that they can be the one to kind of like be there to guide the family, make sure mom and dad close that door. Or they're the one that's going to be closing that door. Um, every child should have that. So I think part of the comprehensive plan is working with DOE. It should be part of the curriculum, right? And on a regular basis, they could send notice back home during holidays just to remind people or, like emergencies, you know, certain time of the year, remind people again what they should do during the winter heating season. Uh, make sure that they don't, uh, you know, make sure that they have space heater, that they have to be careful. It just makes sense to really have that part of a plan um, to incorporate that education, and that will reach million school kids, right? And then the other part is to really outreach to uh, the private school, the parochial school, and make sure that they also get the information that they need. Um, so will you continue to work with DOE to make sure that's part of the DOE curriculum on fire safety? Yeah, so right now we have done tremendous work with DOE in terms of last year over a 1,000 uh, school-based presentations, not only to students but also working with parents. 
but we are looking to amplify it, and we have been in conversation with the Department of Education, not only to target schools and to target schools that we haven't been in as of yet, but also working with their parent engagement division to see exactly how we can uh, enhance that level of outreach in terms of really communicating uh, the importance of fire safety messaging across the board, not only to students, but to parents as well. And in terms of uh, overall material, we are looking to work with DOE in terms of their social media platform and with administrators to see how we can get our messaging not only uh, disseminated electronically, but through social media as well. But do you agree that every school should be in the curriculum, the fire safety? I mean, we agree that fire safety should be given to all parents and to students. So in terms of whichever way that's possible, in terms of working with the Department of Education, we're open to that. So, okay, so that's, that's our goal, right? I mean, it's, it got to reach every student and every parent. It's, it's a good goal to have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I think we have questions from uh, Council Member Rivera. Hi, yes, I just want to echo my colleagues in saying thank you for all that you've done and for the outreach events that I've seen in my district. So I want to just go back to that question about the, the school presentations. Are those year-round or are they only during the regular school year? They're year-round. I mean, we work with, uh, of course, the DOE, with parochial, with uh, private schools, but also in the summertime in terms of, like, the summer camps, the out-of-school time programs, and not only working with the Department of Education, but also with the Department of Youth and Community Development as well. So are you on track for 1,000 visits this year as well? Yes, and I think with new initiatives that I mentioned earlier, not only with the Department of Education, but with the Department of Youth and Community Development, I strongly believe that we'll be able to surpass that. And for the schools that you haven't been in, what are some of the reasons you can't access the grounds or the premises? It's more along the lines in terms of uh, the, re I, I guess, the application process. Um, it's more in terms of like the principals and the administrators who haven't uh, requested us as of yet, but we're trying to work with the Department of Education in terms of addressing that and seeing in which way we can identify those schools and then work with administrators to ensure that we're in. And do you focus on certain neighborhoods because of fire-related incident trends, or do you just try to blanket the city? I mean, we blanket the city ultimately with all fire safety outreach, but we do place an emphasis in terms of the vulnerable populations that are at most uh, risk for fire trends. Um, and we do use uh, data and analytics ultimately to pinpoint and basically do proactive outreach in those districts. Okay, great. And, and I guess the, I have two more questions. One is, of course, working for, with the Department for the Aging, because I know a lot of seniors and, and some of the fire-related incidents and some of the, the senior buildings, too, in, in my district. And I would just want to make sure that you're working aggressively to work with them as well. About and a month in ago. In multiple languages, of course. Yeah. In terms of the multiple languages, we have material right now translated in terms of the, the pamphlets in over 19 in terms of our FDNY Smart website. It can be translated in over 100 languages. But in relation to the Department of Aging, we actually established a partnership with them about two months ago now where we have developed a schedule of targeting every senior center um, throughout uh, each month or throughout the, throughout the year each month and then also with their assisted living centers as well. Okay, and I'm going to jump, since I didn't get a chance to ask about intro 603, the fire hydrants. I know the administration opposes it, but I did want to ask, is there a way for a civilian to assist with this process of identifying inoperable hydrants, and are they easy to identify? For example, I feel like everyone says the white ring means it doesn't work. And so how is the follow-up when those have been identified, and is there anything a civilian can do to assist? Call 311, say, hey, this white ring has been on this hydrant for six months, a year. I'd really love for the FDNY to come out and inspect it. Okay, well, uh, DO, uh, DEP uh, repairs the, um, the unserviceable and defective hydrants. So uh, th they do the follow-up, and when they send us a, um, a notice that it, it's been repaired, we'll go out and, and re-inspect it, and, and we'll remove the disc. Thank you. Okay. Could, I, could I also add, if uh, the public has an uh, inquiry or they have a complaint, they can call the fire department and we'll send a unit out to inspect the fire hydrant. Okay. Thank you so much. And may I also add earlier, I didn't get the opportunity to, uh, to chime in, but you were talking about a list of uh, disabled. I believe uh, NISM is working on that. 
I know that uh, Bureau of Fire Prevention has been working with, with them trying to uh, look at nursing homes uh, out of like the uh, flood zone, coastal flood zones, that will be uh, capable of accepting you know, evacuees from nursing homes within the flood area. Thank you. So uh, we're about to close out um, this portion of the testimony from the administration. Um, I will ask, as I often do, that the administration stay as long as they can. There are, there are regular citizens who'd like to testify and who don't generally get the ear of the administration. So to the extent that you can, uh, we only have two panels. Uh, if you could stay, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you. So I'm going to call the next panel, starting with Amy Binkoff, Carmen Mendez Mirage, Ganesh Mirage, and Lyric Thompson. If we can take this opportunity to affirm your testimony. Can everyone who's testifying raise their right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, I ask before your testimony, you just give your name and title who you're affiliated with before you begin the testimony. You can start wherever you'd like. Uh, we prefer ladies first, but. Tenant. Sorry, tenant. Your name. Carmen Mendez Mirage. I'm a tenant and my name is Ganesh Mirage. I'm a tenant and my name is Amy Binkoff. I'm a tenant and my name is Lyric Thompson. Good morning, my name is, good morning everyone. My name is Carmen Mendez Mirage. I live at 144 West 19th Street, Apartment A for the past 49 years. I'm a proud mother of a four-year-old special needs child and a sister with a developmental disability. On December 25th, 2017, Christmas Day, there was a three alarm fire that started in our apartment building at 3.30 p.m. on the fifth floor. It took approximately 145 firefighters to control the blaze, which took about two and a half hours. I would like to tell you the story about my sister, Joanne Mendez. Unfortunately, she was the only person in the apartment that evening. She went into a panic mode as she lacks cognitive skills in order to process the extent of the danger of the fire that day. She continued to run in and out of our apartment and our building hallway frantically in order to find out, find out whether or not she should evacuate the building or just remain in the apartment. I found out about the fire after a nervous phone call from my sister Joanne who seemed to be in shock, not knowing what to do. Finally at 6 p.m., a neighbor and a Red Cross employee knocked at our apartment door only to find my sister sitting in the dark, alone and afraid, not to, um, afraid of making a move without direction. Good morning, committee. Um, that's my wife, Carmen, and I are here together. We're from the same apartment. Um, I'm just continuing. Unfortunately, this seems to be a common occurrence in most tenement buildings where human lives are lost because of a lack of fire plan implementation. As, res as residents of 144 West 19th Street, Apartment A, me and my family feel very unsafe and live every day in fear since the fire in our building because of the ordeal we all recently faced. Every time my sister-in-law Joanne smells the slightest whiff of smoke, she immediately gets in a panic 
This is very alarming as she at times looks after our special needs child. Our senior citizen neighbors who my wife has known all her life were displaced because of the fire, experienced a further depreciation in health of which has resulted in them not being able to return back into their apartment. We are here today to very sincerely request that Bill 599-2018 to be passed, uh, the bill that Mr. Corey Johnson, I know it's not here today, as part of the New York State law so that millions of residents that live in tenement buildings do not suffer the possible loss of a loved one because of the lack of outreach and education which the FDNY is well equipped to handle. We appreciate the time and the voice that the New York City Council has given us this morning, and we thank you for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I just want to ask, how many units are in your building? We have 33 units. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. My name is Amy Binkoff, and I also live at 144 West 19th Street. On Christmas Day at 3.30 p.m., I was happily watching the marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon Prime when I smelled smoke. Minutes later, the alarms went off, and I heard my upstairs neighbor screaming, my apartment is on fire, my apartment is on fire. I knew that I had to get out fast. All I took were my keys and my cell phone. My apartment suffered water damage, but I was assured that I would be able to come back home within four to six months once repairs were complete. On January 24th, I received a certified letter terminating my lease for substantial repairs. I have to tell you that I'm a rent-stabilized tenant. I've lived in the building for 23 years. It's bad enough to experience the trauma of running out of a burning building to lose almost everything that I own and then be told that I can't go back home because my lease is being terminated for substantial repairs, they might as well just have said your lease is being terminated because we want to get a market value tenant in who will pay twice the amount of money that you can pay. If our leases are allowed to be terminated after a fire, then what's to stop landlords from hiring people to set fire to their buildings to get rent stabilized tenants out? Our landlord demolished my apartment without a permit, ripped out fireproofing in the process, putting the remaining tenants in the building at risk. This is our home. We trust that we're safe. We put our lives in their hands. If a fire started in my apartment now, I have to say I wouldn't know what to do except to run for my life and scream for help. And I have to tell you, that is not enough. I need to be educated because I can't, I might not get lucky the next time, God forbid, it happens again. I need to know everything that I can possibly do to prevent a fire from happening and then to stop a fire from spreading. I'm traumatized by the events of Christmas Day. The fire report, it still says cause undetermined. So now I live in fear. I live in fear of electrical outlets. I live in fear of space heaters, candles. And that's no way for people to live. Tenants have to be educated. I surveyed my friends, and if I have to say, my friends are pretty smart, before coming here. And I asked them if anyone would know what to do if a fire started in their apartment, and every single one of them said no. I urge you to support the passage of Corey Johnson's bill because our lives and our safety depends on it. Thank you so much for listening. So is, is everyone who's here from that building uh, back in their apartment? I am not back. My lease was terminated due to substantial repairs. I'm trying to go back home. And Wait, sorry. They're back. How your apartment wasn't the apartment that was on fire? No, the apartment was on the fifth floor. I'm on the third floor. So you're I below it and suffered just water damage? Just water damage. Just yeah. water damage. And Mr. and Mrs. Mendez Mirage, where is your apartment related to the fire? Ours is on the ground floor. Did you so also suffer water damage as well? Not water damage. Prior to that, we had 24 violations in our apartment. So we have a little different issue, but we were able to get back um, on uh, January 30th, okay. back to the apartment. And I, I saw the, uh, the news coverage of your situation, yes. and um, y your daughter has gotten back in her school and getting the services and stuff that she was. She's concerned back about. on track. Yes. Okay. And how, how is she doing? Is she uh, was she upset from everything that happened? She was. She wasn't herself, and she regressed. She regressed because we weren't home, where she has the freedom to run jump, get her services. Her school is uh, 
a, f a few blocks away from the house. So she was off her routine that we were trying to still drive in for her to go to school, even through a, a snowstorm, so she wouldn't skip a beat. But it was difficult. Okay. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, last question from Ms. Sure. Binkoff. Yes. Were all the apartments on your floor or the floor above you, were they all terminated? The, the leases were all terminated? No. So this is what's going on. The, the other people, a, a gentleman named Miguel, he's been in the building for 45 years. His lease was terminated. It seems I just Is he also rent controlled? He's rent controlled 45 years. It seems what's happening is that the rent control tenants are being terminated. And I just ran into a neighbor, because I'm subletting on the Upper West Side. She's market value, and her lease is not being terminated. Do you believe the firefighters used extra water in your apartment? <laughs> I know the firefighters. I live next door to a firehouse, so we live next door to the firehouse, so the response time was super fast. I actually believe that the down I, I mean, I took pictures. I took a ton of pictures of everything, but I don't think the damage was severe enough for my entire apartment to be demolished. I'm sorry to say, but I think this was a plan, and I think for her, the fire was a Christmas Day gift. Not for me, but it certainly was for her. Thank you. The unit that the fire took place in, is it still offline? Yes. yes. There, yeah, there's yes. no access to that apartment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Hello. My name is Lyric Thompson. I reside at 1355 Decatur Street. And I'd like to speak about standards and HPD and the lack thereof. I was very happy when I saw that you were putting forth this bill with regard to self-closing and self-locking self doors. I believe you all have a little information packet in front of you, a bunch of photos. I see that you say here that they should, it should be the duty of the owner of the multiple dwelling, which is required to be equipped with self-closing doors pursuant to section 28.315.10 to keep and maintain good doors in good repair. Would you say that those doors in these photos are in a state of good repair? We found out we were rent stabilized in the summer of 2015. We are a 421A building that the landlord didn't bother to register the apartments, and he lied to us about the building being stabilized. We also had the added pleasure of being tapped into to provide the heating for the common areas. Since, <sighs> my God, you know, it's a lot st more stressful when you get here. Since 2015, we have dealt with tampered gas lines, a lack of repairs, and HPD, all of those, those photos are what HPD considers repaired. Those are repaired doors to, for HPD. We've had over 97 violations in our building, and one of our biggest issues is that HPD has an unwritten policy with regard to heating. They don't believe that tenants are entitled to heating in the common areas. The heating statute provides a choice. It says, on or, uh, on or after November 1st, 1959, all multiple dwellings shall be provided with heat and the heating equipment and facilities, therefore. Put heat in your building. From October 1st through May 31st, such heat and equipment shall be sufficient to maintain a minimum temperature required by local rule, law, or ordinance. Then it offers you a choice, either in all portions of the dwelling used or those occupied for living purposes. The person that was putting together our building, originally constructing our building, put heating throughout the building. Pursuant to the rent stabilization law, that heating became a required base service upon the issuance of the CFO. This did not matter to HPD. When we made a complaint to DHCR, the landlord's response was to start hacking at our gas and plumbing lines, which if you look at the back side of that packet, you've got a lot of pictures of that as well. I figured, I'll call HPD. All, all equipment in buildings, buildings have to be kept in a good state of repair, right? So in my mind, I thought, I'll call HPD, they'll write a violation, and he'll have to go to DHCR and get an extra boiler and deal with this, this issue. But that's not what happened. HPD told him to rip it out. You ain't entitled to heating. I told HPD, and I, I furnished evidence to HPD that he was tampering with gas lines. DOB had written two violations. One, gas work done without a permit, and two, gas being supplied without testing. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that it was a rent-stabilized building. It didn't matter that they were using unlicensed people, endangering our lives, to do this. 
I've begged HPD for three years to stop engaging in this violation of public policy, and now I'm asking you to do something about it. It did not escape my attention that I had to go to the mayor and ask Bill de Blasio to do a safety sweep in my 421A building that is not completed, and we've had all of these issues in. And thank God he did. They found a gas leak that could have taken out half the block. That was on one side of the building. On our side of the building, our gas leaks were hidden behind the walls. So when DOB came out, we don't see anything. There's drywall. It didn't matter that we had him on recording that he had been tampering with these gas lines. It didn't matter that there were witnesses to this behavior. They couldn't do anything about it. When the gas lines were finally tested over a year and a half after the violation was written, they found gas leaks there too. It's by the grace of the gods that our building didn't blow up. And for three years, I've been begging HPD to do something about this. It's what they tell me. I'd like you to do something about it. Dealing with the consequences of HPD's unlawful behavior is getting gold. No tenant, no citizen in my city should have to endure groveling HPD for proper repairs or just not to break the law and endanger your lives and the lives of your community members. I'd like you to do something about it, please. Are we all on board with that? Everyone? Yes. What is, your, what is the address of your building? 1355 Decatur Street. There's a ProPublica article that was written about it in 2016. Is the former chair here, Jermaine Williams, Councilmember Williams, did he leave? Yeah. He actually brought our building up at, a, at the oversight hearing they had a month after that um, article came out. Unfortunately, he didn't bother to read the article. I wish he had, because had he, he would have known that one of the tenants that we had in that building, her name was Olga Ortiz, was forced out of her rent-stabilized apartment via a holdover. I didn't learn that we were rent-stabilized quick enough to save Olga. But he might have asked Louise Carroll, while he was questioning her, why HPD did not use their statutory authority through the revocation statute to do anything for Ms. Ortiz, to make her whole at all. In fact, they did nothing for Ms. Ortiz. What they did was for the landlord. They allowed this developer to submit forged documents to fiend compliance for Ms. Ortiz. Would anybody like them? I have, I have one of them right here, if you'd like it. Anybody? What, what I'd like you to do is I have two members of my office who are actually here. Upon completion of your testimony, I'd like for you to just submit so we could offer Fantastic, the because mm -hmm. the same developer has a building in your district as well. Okay. He has three in Councilmember Perkins' district, okay. four in Anthony Renozo's district, four in Councilmember Espinal's district. These are not small-time little mom-and-pop guys that we're talking about. We might want to ask ourselves when we're going to deal with the fact that HPD is not enforcing the multiple dwelling laws, because let's be real, if they were, would we have a banned landlord's list? I don't think so. Is HPD pursuing those landlords? Or are they just putting them on a list telling us wh where we shouldn't shop? Do we do this with restaurants? Is there a bad restaurant list where it tells you, <coughs> you might have chicken, you might have rat, take a chance? That's what the city is doing with our housing. We put our lives in HPD's hands to ensure the multiple dwelling laws, to make sure that we are in safe and sanitary housing. And they do not listen, and they violate their own position with ridiculously low standards. I'd appreciate it if this council took HPD to task for, that exact, for exactly that, so that we might, we might do something about our substandard housing, protect our citizens, and of course climate change is here. We're going to experience stronger storms. The repairs, if, if the metric is what you see in those photos, we're going to lose a lot of housing and people will die. And that's just the reality of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Please see young Keegan Sheehan on your way out so that we can uh, set up a time to look further into what you're, what you're alleging. Certainly. Thank you. So we're going to call the next panel.
Now we're going to call up uh, Thomas Lucania from the Office of the Bronx Borough President, Frank Ricci from the Rent Stabilization Association, Melissa Mar uh, Barber, Mechanical Contractors Association of New York, and Robert Unger, Uniform Firefighters Association, Uniform Paramedics and Inspectors. So I will join I'll keep with uh, Councilman Cornegie's tradition of starting with uh, ladies, so man, we'll start with you. Is this on now? I'm okay. Okay. Good morning. My name is Melissa Barber, and I'm with the New York Fire Sprinkler Council, which is a division of the Mechanical Contractors Association of New York. Uh, we're an organization comprised of 130 member firms that employ Steamfitters Local 638. Um, our contractors are licensed and responsible for the installation of an inspection, testing, and maintenance of fire suppression systems in tens of thousands of high-density residential, commercial, and industrial buildings, including hospitals, universities, power plants, and water treatment facilities across the New York region. We're here today because of the result of the recent fire tragedies that struck our city, one being the devastating fire in the Bronx, that killed 12 people, four of whom were children, injured another 14 people, including seven firefighters, and displaced 22 families. Um, this was the deadliest fire in New York City in 27 years, and our fire protection laws have not caught up with the times. In fact, New York City has not passed a significant fire sprinkler system protection legislation for residential buildings since 1999. Currently, New York City does not require existing residential buildings to install fire sprinklers, leaving residents in older, multifamily buildings unprotected. Yet we know fire sprinklers save lives and are the first line of defense, controlling 99% of all fires. The need for fire sprinklers is clear, particularly since the modern residential fires are hotter, more toxic, and burn 800% faster than they did 40 years ago. In a report published this past July by the National Fire Protection Association, we see that from 2010 to 2014, the death rate per 1,000 reported fires was 87% lower in properties with fire sprinklers than in properties without. In addition, where sprinklers were present, flame damage was confined to the room of origin in 97% of fires. This saves lives first and foremost, but also averts major property damage and could be the difference between a family being displaced or being able to return home. Another study conducted by the University of Nevada, Las Vegas College of Urban Affairs showed that smoke detectors without a fire sprinkler system do not appear to be enough to save lives or reduce major home damage. The study also notes that a fire sprinkler system pays for itself in the few, first few months after a home is complete. We applaud the city for enacting significant fire safety legislation that has saved countless lives over the years. One of those laws was Local Law 26, passed in 2004, requiring all commercial buildings over 100 feet or taller to be retroactively equipped with fire sprinklers. Since then, fire deaths in New York City office buildings and businesses have become virtually non-existent. However, this begs the question of equity. If office buildings are required to have sprinklers, and shiny new condos are as well, why are residents who live in older buildings who may be lower income not given the same protection? Florida has taken steps to protect its residents by passing a state law, statewide law regarding sprinklers in residential buildings taller than 75 feet and older than 23 years. We see it can be done, and we are urging the same, that all New York City buildings taller than 75 feet be retrofitted with sprinklers. We know fire sprinklers save lives, and no one should be denied of that protection. What is safe for a building constructed in 2017 should be the same safe for a building built in 1950, and regulations should cover residents in both cases. We cannot wait for another tragedy to strike before we ask, before we act. Let's make sure we learn from the lives lost in the most recent Bronx fire, as well as all of the other lives and homes lost in residential fires. We can and must do more to ensure equity and justice in our fire safety policies. Thank you. I'm sorry, excuse me for my ignorance, 75 feet would be approximately how many units? It's seven to eight stories. It's about what a ladder truck can, you know, above that a ladder truck would have difficulty getting to. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, good afternoon, um, Chairman Borelli, Chairman Carnegie. Uh, on behalf of the Uniform Firefighters Association at the Fire Department, and on behalf of the Uniform DMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors uh, at the Fire Department, I want to thank you for delving into this problem because clearly uh, there are issues that need to be addressed, and this council, uh, through your committees, um, can make a significant impact for public safety in the city of New York and protect people from fires. The, um, I'm, I got brought into this a little bit late in the game, so I didn't submit written testimony today, although usually I do, um, but I will. Um, but I just want to run through some of the bills <clears throat> that, that we uh, took a look at over the weekend. I'll start in, uh, in order. <clears throat> 602, the self-closing doors, um, our members strongly support this legislation. We think this is absolutely terrific. Um, but what we see as a problem is that New York City has had a self-closing door regulation for many years. Uh, to the extent that the new bill strengthens that, we are wholeheartedly supportive and uh, we wanna thank you, Chairman Brelli, for for, for this. However, um, I don't hate to bring up HPD again, but I have no choice. <clears throat> According to media reports, um, some 7,000 violations were issued last year for non-closing doors in New York City. The enforcement is abysmal. It's one thing to write a violation order, it's another thing to follow up. It's another thing to have a significant and meaningful penalty for violations of law that can cause people to die when there's a fire. Um, fire chases air oxygen. So <clears throat> when doors are left open, the fire is naturally gonna want to escape and it will travel upward in, in buildings that have staircases, uh, older buildings in the city, the fire will travel upward. Uh, we had firefighters that were killed years ago in, uh, in the West Village. When that happened, they were in a staircase and fire came out of an apartment below them, went up the stairs and killed them right in the staircase. Um, so we can't urge you enough to take a serious look at what the uh, enforcement agency, HPD, is doing um, about these 7,000 violations just in a year. It, it, it's, it's really, otherwise you can pass all the local laws you want without the enforcement, no teeth. <clears throat> 610, uh, stovetop childproof knobs, um, we like that. Um, enforcement is a problem because for the fire department, for instance, we don't access people's private apartments. Um, we, you know, there are issues uh, involving going to people's property without permission um, and um, we don't. So I don't know how you enforce that, but we think that the idea is a really good one. Uh, could save many children's lives uh, when they are tempted to go and play with the stove. Um, yeah, let's see. 608, posting notices, strongly supported by uh, both the firefighters and, and the inspectors uh, union. Um, we think it's an obvious move. Um, there should be mandatory postings and there should be penalties for failure to comply. Uh, people should see this idea. Uh, people should see that they should close the door. You may remember a number of years ago, under a prior administration, there were public service advertisements that were running on television and it just it showed fire, and it said, close the door. They were terrific, and, and they made a, I believe at that time, they made an impact, and then they went away. But it, it is possible we should be taking a look at bringing back the public service advertising that was done on television, so that when people watched, they were getting the message, and, and, the, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, um, during the commercial, they were told, if your apartment's on fire, you need to get out. And then this ominous voice would come on and just say, close the door. It was really terrific. It was a little scary, 
but it, I think it, it, it made its point, and, and uh, even in the, within the fire department, you know, we were talking about it as having been a, you know, kind of an effective thing at the time, but it went away. It's something that you might want to take a, a, a look at, but we strongly support. Well, I, I just want to tell you that you, you actually don't have to go point by point. You have three business days to actually submit in writing your responses to it. I, I don't want to discourage you, but um, uh, you, you may consider that you don't have to today uh, support or non-support. You have three business days to actually submit to us in writing what you suggested that you would. Understood. Uh, your responses to each. So that is an alternative that Und you have understood. available. I would like to make the testimony, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, with regard to the fire hydrants, intro 603, um, the Firefighters Union opposes uh, this piece of legislation. Um, we feel that the program that we have is already in place and covers what uh, is covered in this legislation and more. Um, and our concern is that we would like to re have the fire commissioner, uh, Dan Nigro, um, who's terrific, um, and our chief officers uh, continue to supervise the existing program and they're actually very good, like during the winter, uh, the chief earlier described some of the extra things that we already do. <clears throat> we, you know, we, we think that it, it, it might be best left to the commissioner and the chiefs how to run that program, but because we already do what would be in, in the statute, um, and it's just a strong preference that we continue to operate uh, that way. We have some really experienced fire officers running the fire department and um, um, they actually are, have been out there when frozen hydrants when they were firefighters themselves and uh, they have a sensitivity uh, to these problems. Uh, fire safety education 609, um, we like it but we're curious as to who, who is going to actually do the educating if we expand the program uh, that we already have, and how does it get paid for? Uh, concern is um, there's no appropriation attached to some of these programmatic recommendations, and that um, the only way place the department can go for money is to operations. And to go to the actual response budget to fund uh, programmatic things can be dangerous, and we are very concerned about the department being forced by statute to uh, move money away from operations into programs. We don't have a problem with the programs, but if they're going to be expanded beyond where we are now, we would like you to consider uh, an appropriate appropriation to cover the costs of the additional programs. Uh, 599, the speaker's bill. Um, we, uh, as the fire department does, we support the concept of this bill. Um, we think that outreach to landlords is a good thing. Uh, we're, we would like some more clarity about how that's going to happen. You know, are we talking about sending fire companies to try to find every multiple dwelling owner in New York City? That won't work. We know it won't work because most of them don't live in the buildings that they own. Some of them don't even live in the state. Um, so, you know, we'd be looking for people that are not going to be found. And we don't have enough fire inspectors in the city. We have about 400. And they are already overstretched with the more than a million uh, occupancies that they're responsible for. And all the specialties like explosion things, construction, electrical. It's um, with our current staffing, we wouldn't actually, uh, you know, really be able to function properly if we had to follow this without some clarification. Maybe you could consider doing it uh, notification by mail. It could be registered mail. Make somebody sign for it. Then we could send it to the landlord or even if they live in Ohio. Um, but we don't think it's practical with our firefighters and inspectors to go out and find all the multiple dwelling owners. Um, it says good faith effort, which we appreciate, and I'm sure the department would do that but we just don't have the, any kind of staff that can find these people. Although we, they, the city does know where they are, so maybe mail of some kind might be the way to go. Um, those are the bills that we're concerned with. Um, we, we generally think that the council and 
the chairs are going in the correct direction for public safety and fire safety in the city. Um, and we want to thank you for really getting into this. There's a broad array of things in here in, uh, that you're proposing. Um, and except for, the, except for the hydrants, you know, we're generally uh, okay. So thank you again, and I will turn it over. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we hear from Mr. Lucania from the uh, Bron Bronx Borough President's Office. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Cornegy and Chairman Borelli. My name is Tom Lucania, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, Jr. regarding intro 608, 609, and 610. Borough President Diaz, City Council Member Richie Torres, and Council Member Kaim Deutsch have in introduced a package of legislation designed to prevent catastrophic fires in the wake of December's tragic fire in the Belmont section of the Bronx, which saw 13 lives lost. Borough President Diaz, Councilmember Torres, and Deutsch introduced three bills that would improve fire safety and education and potentially save lives. Intro 610 would require owners of buildings with three or more units to provide and properly install approved stove safety devices on all stoves in units where a child or children 10 years or younger reside. Intro 609, which re would require the fire department in coordination with the Department of Education to implement a comprehensive plan for educating children and parents about fire safety and prevention. And intro 608 would require landlords to post a notice indicating that those escaping a fire should close all doors behind them. These bills would help prevent future tragedies and keep our first responders out of harm's way to save lives. On Thursday, the 28th of December, a fire broke out on Prospect Avenue in Belmont. It led to 13 deaths, making it the deadliest fire New York City has seen in the past 25 years since an inferno at the Happy Land Social Club, which killed 87 people in 1990. In this case, investigators found that the fire was started by a three-year-old child playing with a stove in his apartment and quickly drew, grew out of control. Just as we require window guards in apartments with young children, we should also require that stoves be made safer through the installation of approved safety devices. This tragic fire could have been prevented had this young child been unable to tamper with the knob of the stove in his apartment. The flames spread quickly in part because as the boy's mother fled the burning apartment, she left the door open. For a small investment of just a few dollars per stove, we can prevent children from easily tampering with the knob and accidentally causing a fire. We also can educate families to close the door behind them if they are escaping a fire in order to prevent the fire from spreading. Additionally, we can do more to educate children and families on fire safety and prevention. This is critical legislation that will protect our families our neighbors and keep our fire department and other first responders safe in an emergency. One of the 13 people who died in this fire was PFC Emmanuel Mansa. PFC Mansa lived in this building, was found dead in an apartment that was not his own. He was trying to rescue his neighbors and he succumbed to the blaze. There are many ways we can honor his memory and preventing future tragedy and this is one of them. I thank Councilmember Torres and Deutsch for their partnership on this legislation, and I look forward to seeing these laws, which directly address the causes of deadly disasters like this, passed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. And then finally, Mr. Frank Ricci of RSA. Thank you, Chairman Cornegy, Chairman Borelli, Councilmember Chin. Uh, my name is Frank Ricci. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Rent Stabilization Association. We represent about 25,000 building owners in the city. Collectively, those buildings contain about 1 million units of housing. Um, I know you're having a hearing in a few weeks on the housing and vacancy uh, survey that just came out. I looked at it quickly last week when I first, uh, when your council you know, finally sent it to me. And I believe there's 2.4 million units of housing in this city that that survey looks at. So I heard Mr. Unger talk about 7,000 violations for not, doors that were not uh, closing properly. So 7,000 out of probably 2.6 million doors in the city, that's not bad, but 
as it relates to intro 602, it's already the law in the multiple dwelling law and the housing maintenance code, so we fully support 602. Um, owners should keep them in good, good repair. They should be working. Unfortunately, on the newer type of self-closers, where it's on the hinge, tenants will sometimes take the pins out because they don't want the door to be self-closing. When the owners are aware of it, they fix it again. Um, complying with, with uh, any violation is always a challenge because of access, but we fully support the law and uh, we don't have a problem with having the requirement that we maintain them. Intro 604, which uh, is Chairman Cornegie's bill on photoelectric uh, smoke detectors. This has been the subject of at least three or four hearings that I'm aware of in the last four years uh, by this council. And I looked at all the old testimony and it seemed that there was a difference of opinion between the fire department and various fire safety organizations and testing companies around the country. Um, there's a debate about, depending on what the location is in the department, whether an ionization smoke detector is better than a photoelectric detector. Uh, we fully support the process that, that DOB is going through now in terms of looking at the code. And if they say that everything should be a photoelectric uh, smoke detector, we're fine with that. Our only concern is that <clears throat> Now, um, we just completed a round about four years ago of making sure that every smoke detector in the city uh, is replaced at the end of its useful life, which is now they have a 10-year a battery that's tamper-proof so the tenant cannot remove the battery from the smoke detector. And tenants, they, they've been installed over the last four years in apartments. And tenants pay $25 each time that happens and $50 if it's a combination uh, carbon monoxide smoke detector. So. All we're saying is if, if, if the council feels that the technology is there and it is evolving, and you heard Ju Julian Basil point, about the, um, point out the fact that there's a lot of differing technology and it's changing all the time, but if through DOB, through their code committee, if they feel that there's a better detector, we're okay with that. We would just suggest that it be done at the end of the useful life so that it's, it's a phased in uh, replacement of the current detectors. Um, if you do something blanket all at once, there's usually a shortage of, of things like this. And to phase it in, it's easier on the tenant, it's easier on the owner, but we, we don't have a problem with whatever the technology says is the best. Intro 608, which is the notice for self-closing doors. I, since there was a lot of discussion today about what goes on the back of a door, I had the Sergeant at Arms give you the, the notices that go on the back of doors. The little red mark in the corner is for combustible buildings, and for the blue one is for non-combustible buildings. So it's slightly different, but the first item on each notice is, if there's a fire, close the door. There's also a fire safety notice that's in the lobby of every building, which expands on the building specifics of what you do in that building. And then, on top of all that, there's a fire safety plan that has to be sent to every uh, resident of a multiple dwelling that's three or more units once a year, which tenants get. So I'm and in there in both of those other two notices, the plan and the notice says if you leave the apartment, close the door. So I don't know what more you can do to get tenants to pay attention to close the door, but if they need to highlight it, you know, bigger on the notice, we're fine. We've sold millions of those over the years, so I know they're on the back of doors. And we continue to sell thousands, tens of thousands a year because owners replace them when they renovate an apartment. Sometimes tenants paint their own apartments, they paint over the notices. Lots of times they hang things over that notice on the back of the door, and the owner asks them to please not do that, but it's an ongoing process. If they want to change the notice, make it bigger, bolder, different colors, we're all for it. I heard Councilwoman Chin talk about translation. I assume that means you would support something where an owner could then send a notice to every tenant each year asking who's living in the apartment and what languages they speak uh, so that owners would know because there's no way an owner knows who a tenant moves into their apartment or what language they speak. So the only way we could determine that is if you would support something at the state level where DHCR would allow us to now get an actual list of who the residents are in each building each year, each apartment. I thought that would be your reaction. Um, and then finally, the intro 610, well, how else would an owner know? No, the owner doesn't know. The owner doesn't matter. There's turnover, there's people who, there's tenants all the time who move other residents in, move in roommates. The owner has no idea. And it's very common. Um, 610 is the last one I'm gonna comment on, which is, has to do with safety knobs. Um, 
it's not a, we, we have no problem with providing them. It's not a cost issue. My problem is with the enforcement of it. Um, a lot of our members do give those to tenants when they ask for them now. And what happens is a week or two later, they go in the apartment and they've taken them off because they are a, a, a nuisance to have on there. Most of the safety knobs that are approved, you need two hands to undo the knob to use the, to use the stove regularly. Tenants oftentimes get frustrated with them, so they just remove them. Or they'll remove them on two knobs and leave them on the two others that they may not use those, those burners all the time. So my problem is with the enforcement, because if it's going to be for children under 10, which I think is a little extreme, because a 10-year-old should really know not to play with a stove. If a 10-year-old is playing with the stove, the knobs on the stove, they've got other problems besides just tinkering with the knobs. They should be, um, the, the enforcement of this is going to be such that an inspector is going to go in, see a child under, nine, under 10, there's no knobs on there, and there's no way the owner can certify that he's corrected. He can give the tenant the knobs again and put them on, and if the tenant takes them off again two weeks later, there's no way the owner can, can uh, honestly respond and say that he's corrected that violation. So if there's a better outreach program, a, a giveaway program like they have with uh, smoke detectors, we're all for it. But we don't have a problem with the cost. It's a minimal cost. And if tenants want them, most of the owners that we represent would just gladly give them to the tenants because they don't want any fires in their building. And that's it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. For the record, we just want to announce that we've uh, received testimony from the Association of Building Owners of Greater New York and Rebney. This hearing is now officially adjourned.